Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who brings joy to our lives in the midst of our pain and suffering, in the midst of our struggles throughout life, we find joy in the Christ child who would one day die for us. Amen. When you think about the Christmas season, do you think about joy? Maybe you do. Joy is a hard thing to kind of describe. You know, often people think it's an emotion, but it's not quite an emotion. It ha- involves the emotion, certainly, like happiness and excitement, but it's something deeper. It involves this kind of contentment and being in the moment and, and present and being content with, with what is going on. You know, ha- have you experienced this joy? Maybe you find joy and when you get to hold a, a newborn baby. Maybe you find joy as you drive down the road and see all the Christmas lights on the houses or in your homes. Maybe you find joy in the fact of having a, a cup of hot chocolate by the fire at night. But maybe you're sitting here today and you're not feeling so joyful. Maybe you're struggling with life. Maybe there's a lot of things that are seeming like they're sucking the joy out of your life. Maybe there's problems. Maybe there's issues. Maybe there's health struggles. Maybe there's a bunch of things that are going on. And you feel like, where is my joy? I feel like I should be joyful right now, but I'm not. So where do you find joy? If you're experiencing that right now, or if you experienced that in the past, that, that struggle and pain. Well, today, we go to our Savior, who brings perfect joy for us. It, it doesn't matter if it's the Christmas season, or the heat of the summer, or no matter during your life, or on the timeline of the human being ever since the fall, there has been struggle in the world. There has been pain and suffering. There has been strife and fighting. There has been all these kinds of things in the world. Life is challenging. It is difficult. I know it because I live it with you. It's a challenge each and every day. And so we we long for, for joy, but we are not the only ones who suffer. They're not the only ones who endure pain and trouble in life. No. Again, it's always been there since the fall into sin. And we see it with the Israelite people today as Isaiah is proclaiming this news to them. The Israelites were in Babylon. They had been brought into exile and there they were captives or slaves and they were not in their hometown. And so we hear, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, your tongue mutters wicked things. You know, why were they in exile in Babylon? It's because they rejected the Lord. They rejected His promise. They didn't want to worship Him. Instead, they got caught up in life and started worshiping idols and other things. And their hearts started going to themselves and their own passions and desires. And so the Lord turns his face away from them and sends them off into captivity, allowing the Babylonians to come in, destroy their lives, destroy the temple and all that they knew. And now they're in this exile in Babylon, in a land that they do not know. And you could imagine the, the pain that they had. This desire to want to go home, to go back to their homeland. But they are trapped here. And you could think about them, you know, pondering their sins and thinking about all the wrongs that they had done and and repenting to the Lord. Lord, forgive us. Lord, show us mercy. We know we we didn't worship you and praise you the way we should have. We we did not live our lives that reflected your your desire for our lives. You know, you could imagine that existence in that place. Then, You know, where do they find their joy? Where do they get their joy from? In chapter 60, you hear, Arise, shine, for your light has come, 
and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, the darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. You know, you say, you know, remember how, how the Lord's face was toward them? He had turned His face away from them in, in anger over their sin and unbelief. He says, if you don't want to worship me, if you don't want to be with me, then you're going to be thrown away from me. But the God of all mercy and grace hears their repentive cries. He hears them when they cry for His mercy and grace. And the Lord shows forgiveness. He shines His face on them once again. Although you have been forsaken and hated, with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. Yes, the Lord will bring joy back into their lives. He will deliver them from their captivity. He will give them His face back, and He will love His people by His mercy and grace and forgiveness. And this mercy and grace will exceed the generations after them. They will know how great and merciful the Lord is. You know, if you heard this joyful news, how would you respond? How would you react? Maybe you've been enslaved for your whole life. Maybe it's just been a part of it. But either way, hearing that the Lord's face would turn back to you, you'd be overjoyed. And maybe even for these people... Tears of joy going down their face and saying, The Lord forgives us. The Lord is merciful. Isn't this good news? Whenever the Lord shows us mercy and grace, most certainly it is. And so Isaiah tells us today, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I think when you first look at this, you might think, who, who is the writer? Who's the one saying it? You might think it's Isaiah, right? This is in the book of Isaiah. He's the one talking to his people on behalf of God. But there's actually a different person who is speaking. A different person this is, is being spoken about. You know, this is the one who was promised. Yes, they, this one, one individual was man, but they were also God. It is Jesus, that is who Isaiah is talking about. You know, you see this word anointed in the passage, and you, you think about Jesus' baptism. At Jesus' baptism, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit as it came upon him as a dove. And you remember, the Father said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And you see Jesus go out then in his ministry, you know, serving His Heavenly Father's will and telling that good news to the nations. You just have to open up your Bibles to Luke in chapter 4, and you see this right away, right away in Jesus' ministry. We hear, He went to Nazareth where He had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day He went into the synagogue, as was His custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, here Jesus is in the synagogue. He finds the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolls it, and he finds the section that is our text for today, and he reads it to the people. And essentially, he's saying, this is the good news that was promised to you, your ancestors. This is the good news of the one who would come to proclaim the good news to the nations, to fulfill the good news that was promised to all people. And that's exactly what Jesus emphasizes. He says, He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus had come 
to fulfill the scriptures. Jesus came to proclaim that good news to all people of all nationalities, Gentiles and Jews alike, to save all people, poor and hurting, and all of them. And, and if you needed more proof that Jesus came to proclaim this good news, you go a little bit further in the Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and you hear this from Jesus. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim what? The good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Again, why was Jesus sent? It's emphasized over and over again to proclaim that good news. And what did he do as he went throughout all those towns? He healed the sick. You know, he raised the dead. He proclaimed the good news that he was the Savior of the world. You know, this is good news. This is the good news, you know, the Israelite people had been waiting for. This was the good news that was proclaimed to Adam and Eve after they had fallen into sin, that the Savior would come. And now he was here. You know, who is this good news for? Who, who did Jesus bring this good news uh, in the world for these people? You know, the, the poor, but also many others. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. You know, does God care about those who are hurting? Yes. Does God care about those who are struggling and in strife and in, in this internal turmoil? Yes, he does. He, he cares about them so much that he wants them to have this good news. As Christians, we are going to suffer. As Christians, we are going to endure. Life is not going to be comfortable. Not in any way. Look, our God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger, and he gives us this compassion that, that we do not deserve. He showers it upon his people. You know, is this something that we want to hold on to? Yes, most certainly it's something we want to hold on to because it is good, and it's for us. You know, you focus on the joy that Jesus brings and being in the favor of our God. You know, apart from, you know, if we were, if our God had turned away from us, how miserable of a life that would be. You know, but when God's face is turned toward us, how joyful it is and comforting. And it was comforting for those people too. And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Jesus is the one with his good news and his grace makes us new. He gives us a crown of victory by his death. He gives us these robes of praise and righteousness that only can come from our God. This is the God who, who makes us a, a stump or a, 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 as strong as an oak tree that cannot be pushed aside or moved because He is the one who grounds us. He is the one who sustains us in life. This is what our God does. Is this not joyous? It is. It's the thing that we want to hold on to the most. Yet I wonder, do we hold, really hold on to it? Do we really appreciate it for what it is? You know, or, or does life happen? Do the struggles of life start flowing in? You know, here's more pain, here's more sickness, here's more struggle, here's more strife. You know, here's all these different problems that I'm enduring. You know, do we hold on to God's joy in those moments? Or do we seem to let it slip out of our fingers? 
I kind of wonder if it goes something like this. Maybe this happens to you. It happens to me. Maybe I'm, I'm trying to be a little more healthy. You know, maybe I, I, I want to make sure, you know, I'm, the moment I wake up, I'm not necessarily starting work right away or going too late. So I want to have, you know, good times where I, I, I'm working or I'm with the family or, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm going on my walks, having my devotions, having my vitamins, making sure I'm having my smoothie right away in the morning. You know, I want to make sure that I feel good. And so I, I, I try to make sure all these things are flowing nicely. And, you know, I, I feel good when they're going right. But then life starts to happen. Things start to come up. And you start, you know, running around. Kids get sick. Things are, are happening in life. And you have your own struggles. And you're like, you know, I, I worked out last week. Or I worked out yesterday even. And, and so I, I'm not going to work out today. And so what ends up happening, you're like, oh, I didn't work out yesterday, I can wait another day. And so it becomes a week and after that, and, you know, I, I get so busy at night doing different things, and, and then I forget to maybe take my, my vitamins at night or in the morning. And then all of a sudden, you know, it seems like life is all crazy, and I'm like, well, how did I get here? Well, why do I feel so miserable? Well, it's forgot, I forgot all the things that I needed to Take care of my body, God's temple. And, and those things are good, right? God wants us to take care of our temple. But do we sometimes treat God's word, the good news, this way? You know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to church regularly. You know, I, 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 I get to hear the good news. And I leave church, you know, if it's Thursday night or Sunday morning, with joy. You know, my sins are forgiven. I'm praising my Lord once again. And then I go home and I, I maybe even do my prayers and my devotions and, you know, I, I feel good. You know, I, I'm finding those joyful things that I need for my life. But then life starts to happen. Work gets crazy. You know, this time of year, there's a lot of things you have to do and you feel like you have to do. And then soon you're like, okay, maybe, you know, I, I'm not going to make it to church this week. And then what ends up happening sometimes for some, maybe it's happened to you too, you start being like, oh, you know, I didn't go last week, and it's still too busy. I'll, I'll go next week, and then next week comes, and, and the next week passes, and you're, you're finding yourself away from God's Word. You, you find time, you're not finding time at home to do your prayers or devotion life. And then you start thinking, you know, with everything that's going on, why do I feel so miserable? You know, why, why do I feel so terrible? Where, why don't I have joy right now? Well, it's because you've given up all the good things for you. No, you, you're not in the Word where, where the, the joy renews you each and every day and is needed, most certainly. You know, we're really no different than those Israelite people, are we? You know, you read through the Old Testament, you see this kind of wave effect. You know, you see that they're doing wonderful, they're praising God, and, and they're worshiping Him. And then soon, the, the sinful world gets the best of them, and then they're in this trough. And God has to step in and say, hey, what are you doing? You know, I am your God. Worship me. And so he, he corrects them and they come back and they're, they're praising him again. And they're saying, Lord, how merciful you are. And soon later they're back in that trough again. You know, how often do we seem to do that kind of trough method where it's like, hey, I'm praising the Lord. But then I get caught up in life. I'm in the struggles of life. I'm not in the Word like I should be. The Lord should do the same that He did to the Israelite people, to us. He should turn our, His face away from us. He should bring His wrath and punishment upon us. He should cast us away into the eternal fires of hell for all eternity. Most certainly. And let, really let that sink in. It's important. It really is. Because if we don't realize, you know, what we really need, if we don't realize how sinful we are and that God's face should turn away from us, the good news is not really that good then. Because if we understand the depravity that we're in, the state that we're in, the, the situation in our, our sin that we deserve death and punishment, you know, if we understand that, then the gospel is so more, much more precious. It has so much more value for your life and mine, does it not? Because it says to us, you don't have to suffer anymore. You don't have to endure hell. 
or, or, or God's judgment, because God's judgment came upon that Christ child that we worship and adore, that Christ child who died on the cross for your sin and mine. This is the Savior of the world that we can give joyful praise to because He loved us. He loves you. Even in your state, even in your lowest moment, even in your sin, the Lord comes back to you over and over again and says, says you know, I love you. I, I forgave your sin. I, I paid for it on the cross. Right? And so if we understand this, if we cherish God's good news, if we find joy in it, how will we respond? We will respond with delight. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. We find delight in the Lord. We find delight in his love. We find delight in his grace that is ours now and forever. And if we find delight, we will reflect our lives with that light and that joy to the world and to others. We will not live in sin. We will not crawl around in that darkness. We will not hide it like we, hey, you know, I'm in the light, but behind me in my other day life, I'm going to hide in this darkness and play around in it. No. We are in the light. We are in God's grace. And we must live in that out of thanks for what He has done. God has allowed us by His grace and mercy to live for Him. How wonderful. So no matter what, you're going on, what is going on in your life, no matter the struggles, no matter the hardships, you have joy. You have peace with your Lord and Savior. And do we not sing this? this time of year, where we give praise to our God and say the, the joy that is in our heart. Maybe, maybe you cherish this hymn. It's also in our, our hymnal still. Joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and he heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. What will we repeat? The sounding joy that we have, the joy that is for the world, the joy that is for our lives. This is the joy that we get to experience now and forever as God's people. How wonderful. How joyful. Amen. Please stand.